Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 46, Towering Pressure. I'm Mark Kane. Today, I tell a story. I've known I would tell this since before the first episode. It doesn't have any car chases or pianos dropping from apartments. But it was one of those moments where many things suddenly came into high definition It was a profound experience for me. You've probably had moments like this where even years later, in this case 27 years later, it still comes to mind often, where at any moment in any given day, you're immediately transported back to that one day so long ago. It was that kind of an experience for me. It's the story of one meeting. It took place on a single Saturday morning. I've sometimes described this story when speaking to potential future podcast guests, and and here's why. When talking to a future guest, we discuss possible topics, and quite often it leans toward my life story, and naturally so. I mean, every person has a life story. And yes, we do always fill in some background information with guests. It helps to frame the story. The real magic is what we wrap around the frame. Some of the most gripping topics are the stories. Like Amanda Dunn's homeschooling story in episode 34. I walked out of the training. I got to the car. My hands were shaking. I called my mom. (laughs) You've got some you call, right? I called my mom. Yeah. Or like when the Kuntzmans received a rather surprising please don't come back letter in episode 29. They had to make sure that we got the letter so that we would not darken the doors of their church ever again. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that is that is crazy. That was crazy. <laughs> or Eric Miller and the Fast Food Bible in episode 26. I got back in my car and I looked in the rearview mirror and I saw her get up, the Bible's still on the ground, and walk inside. Or the story of my sister's account of the um, pleasant delivery of a loaf of bread in episode 18. I said, it's probably, we, you know, maybe we need to come a few more times and we can discuss it later if you want or something. She goes, no, really, tell me, what is it? And she was like begging me to tell her. I'm like, okay, here we go, God. (laughs) Hope this goes well. Or Mary McCarty's unexpected friendships in episode 22. Almost everybody there had not succeeded in society. Wow. A lot of them, this was sort of their last-ditch effort before they had to go back home and come crawling back to their families and say, I tried to make it on my own and I couldn't. Or like when Mark Silvera had realized the power and simplicity of the Shema and then laid in bed reading a book describing our one God. Every page that I read I would turn to my wife and say, how embarrassing, how embarrassing that I believed this false dogma Mm. for 50 years. Or my very first guest, the story of Hildy Chandler's day at the dining room table across from her heretical son, Keegan, author of The God of Jesus. Back in episode two. That, you know, I would say, well, you're, you're going to hell if you don't believe Jesus is God. And he would say, well, where is that in the scripture? And I said, well, <laughs> I, I don't know, but it's in there. You know, it, it's got to be in there because this is, what we've, this is what we've been taught. There's a good chance you've heard all of these stories already. Just mentioning them again draws me back to them. I remember their laughter, their frustration their pauses to collect their thoughts or hold back tears. These are now parts of our collective memory, yours and mine. So when I'm talking to someone about a future podcast topic, I point out that I'm not specifically looking for life stories. I'm simply looking for stories. They can be anything that is meaningful, life-altering, or hilarious. The bulk of our interview could be talking about something that happened in a very brief encounter. Maybe you've shared a tale with friends before and maybe told it a dozen or more times. It's probably that kind of story. And that's like the one today. 
This is my example of how one short event can have so much meaning or impact that it could be an entire episode. My interviews don't have to be sweeping narratives that walks us through childhood, college, a career, etc. It could be just one curious day that had more in store for you than you could have imagined. I attended Atlanta Bible College from 1989 to 1993. That school is one of the ministries of the Church of God General Conference. Atlanta Bible College was also one of the sponsors at the 2021 UCA Conference. I had decided not to follow in my father's and my older brother's pastoral footsteps, and my younger brother also became a pastor later. But I had fallen in love with radio, specifically the talking type. That was my plan. After college, I moved to Ohio and back in with my parents, and my dad was pastoring on the east side of Cleveland. I spent one year attending a small radio training school and got a job on a local AM radio station. It was a Christian station, but kind of independent, not part of any large organized network like Moody Radio. We played some James Dobson programs during the day, some news programs, lots of music, and at night, it was black gospel. That was my shift, midnight to 5 a.m. Again, it's 32 degrees right now. Precipitation coming down in the form of a little rain, a little freezing rain, some snow. Hopefully it won't be too bad by morning time. Here's the Indiana Avenue Missionary Baptist Church Mass Choir of Toledo, Ohio, and God will fight your battles. And you heard it here on WRDZ. I did that for over a year and a half. And I became very familiar with the gospel music that was popular that year. Kirk Franklin and the Family, the Mississippi Mass Choir, Andre Crouch, B.B. and C.C. Winans, and one of my personal favorites, the Five Blind Boys. It wasn't talk radio, but it was great. Many nights, I'd put a cassette on of one of our local church services. This was how they shared their services to the broader community, before the days of Facebook Live and Zoom. They recorded them on cassettes, and then they postal mailed them to the radio station. They purchased the time slot, and it wasn't very expensive to purchase an hour between midnight and 5 (laughs) a.m. I don't remember when the idea came to me, but perhaps it was in the middle of the night after I had put in one of these cassettes and hit play. The preacher comes on with some announcements and praises and singing, I pushed my rolling chair away from the board, across the carpeted floor, because the studio was designed to have little echo, carpet, panels, etc. I knew I had over 30 minutes to relax. No weather forecasts, no changing CDs, no commercials to play. I would often walk out on the upper deck and look across a broad field next to the radio station and see if I could spot some deer in the moonlight. It was a peaceful time. It may have been on that deck that I was thinking about theology, naturally I did that a lot, and my recent time at the Bible College, and I thought of Anthony Buzzard. He was my professor for several classes at the college, and a friend. Anthony Buzzard is a very outspoken proponent of the unity of God and the coming kingdom of God. He's also written several books. If pastors could purchase time on the air, Maybe we could find a way to get Anthony on the air, too. That was my thought. But, nah, this may be a more independently operated station, but still, it's Trinitarian. But I called Anthony, and we talked about it. He was mad about the idea, in the way an Englishman is mad about something, not how us Americans are. He was excited. We discussed the topic possibilities, The Trinity was likely to get the program rejected immediately. But the idea of our future hope was a possibility. I think it was his idea to appeal to a simple question that people often ask. What happens when we die? I took the idea to management, and they were a bit surprisingly okay with it. I mean, it didn't scream controversy after all unlike some of the clever titles of Anthony's books, like Our Fathers Who Aren't in Heaven. (laughs) That's one of my favorite titles. Oh, and we did pay for the airtime, so that helps. So I helped Anthony select and configure some recording gear in his home, and the program was born. 
Join Anthony Buzzard on the program What Happens When We Die weekday mornings at 9.45 and Sunday afternoons at 2.45. Our daily program is devoted to the great questions of life and death. What is our destiny as human beings? Are we naturally immortal creatures who only appear to die? Challenge yourself to biblical examination of mankind's common fate. Christians, however, should be committed to the ideal of speaking of death as Jesus did. What happens when we die weekday mornings at 9.45 and Sunday afternoons at 2.45 only on Stereo 1260 WRDZ. I should note that the AM station didn't have a massive following, and it wasn't a 50,000-watt powerhouse that you could hear from Cuba. It was small. So... I had no idea what would come of it, but I did put my phone number at the end of the program so that if anyone local wanted to learn more, I would be able to connect with them. Sort of like I do now, but using the medieval technology of 27 years ago. Yes, it was a landline. I don't remember how many episodes got aired, but one day I did get a call. It was a kind gentleman who belonged to a group that came out of the Seventh-day Adventist. They also looked to the resurrection for their life-after-death hope, and he resonated with what was in the program, so I knew at least one person had heard it. He was blind, so I guess it wasn't so surprising that he listened to radio during the day. We had a nice talk. I learned that they had broken away from the Seventh-day Adventists, but I don't remember why. What I do remember was that they were pretty sure they were it, the last remnant, the true followers who came out of the true church when that true church lost its way. How fortunate, I suppose, that I had made contact with the last remnant of God's church and that they were here in the Cleveland, Ohio area. (laughs) Okay, I wasn't at all persuaded that this was the last vestige of faith, But even back then, I wasn't surprised that they thought this way. It's actually rather common. How many groups exist even today that think they have the truth exactly right and everyone else is effectively not saved and not Christian? There are a lot. I think the group tendency is a bit like sin in humans. It's there, ever crouching at the door, our persistent weakness. Well, churches have exclusionarianism always crouching at the door, and many are those who succumb. And of course, these groups that think they are the last true church, (laughs) they are naturally all mistaken, because we know it's my church that is the true and last final church. So he invited me to one of his group's home fellowships. I was eager to visit. It was about a 25-minute drive, and I arrived a bit early. They knew who I was, the guy from the What Happens When We Die program. I enjoyed a bit of talk while others arrived. At some point, the teacher or preacher, whatever his title was, arrived, and I only remember a brief hello with him. Soon we sat down in the living room, probably around 20 of us, some on couches, some on chairs that were scooted over from the dining room table. I had a spot on the couch, about three meters from the teacher's chair. I could hear him clearly. Looking around the room, I noticed one curiosity. We were all men except for the wife of the host. These were grown men, some old enough to be retired. Surely at least a few of the 20 also had a spouse, but, well, I filed that away under curious and I didn't open my mouth. Now I wish that I had at least asked why. Where were the women? There was no music just some brief announcements about the meal to follow, a bit of prayer, and then into the lesson. The teacher had us turn to Micah 4, verse 3, and he focused squarely on the middle part of that verse. Here's how it goes. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. (laughs) I was with him that far. And then he continued. This passage explained what we were currently seeing in the world. The swords in that passage were not literal swords. They were Bibles, Scripture. He explained that it was talking about the Word of God. And he did cross-reference Ephesians 6.17, where the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So I understood the connection of sword and word, but he really drove that point home. 
the world and more specifically other Christians, not them naturally, had taken the Bibles, the Word, and turned them from powerful and piercing weapons against evil and transformed them into harmless farming implements. Christianity had disregarded, disrespected, and discounted the powerful truth of Scripture. In this passage, Micah 4.3 pronounced it. He spent a good amount of time clarifying some examples of how Christianity had neutered Scripture and how important it is to treat the Bible with the respect it is due because, as noted in Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So, his lesson was thought out well, he brought in these other verses, and he did make some great points about how pitifully many in Christianity understood or utilized teachings from Scripture. But, did you catch it? Let me repeat it. The passage from Micah 4.3 was telling us about the Bible apostasy taking place in our midst. Hmm. So, the lesson concluded. We probably had a prayer, and then I looked around, expecting a discussion, something. But everyone looked like it was done, turning to each other, gathering their things, and the teacher started to move like it was off to lunchtime. So I raised my hand. Did you have a question? He asked, standing in front of his chair, looking at me like he wasn't sure what was happening. Yes, is that all right? Is this when I can ask questions? Uh, yes, okay. And he sat back down. The collective shuffling that I had noticed a moment earlier had entirely stopped. The room was still. The teacher waited. Let me pause here. If you've heard some of my insight episodes, that's what I call them, where I talk about what goes on inside us, the struggle of right and wrong, the desire for inner peace versus the selfish desire to escape our conscience, then you're going to catch where I'm going here. To learn more, see episodes 5, uh, did God put coal in my stocking? 24, conscience, and 35, the spirit of error. So, I had listened closely and knew that the questions I had were entirely reasonable, and I knew there was no wrong in seeking understanding, and I knew at that moment I was not looking to enhance myself or my pride or my image. I have spoken of the peace that exists when you are acting in truth, in accordance to what is good and right and without pride. I didn't know these people. I knew I'd probably never see them again. Yes, I technically could have raised my hand to be seen and to stand out as maybe better than them or their teacher. But it was much simpler than that. I simply needed clarification on something which I thought was confusing, and it never occurred to me that it would turn into what it did. Uh, when you read Micah 4.3, I asked, about the swords into plowshares, did you mean that it's an analogy for what's happening today? I really don't think he understood my question. Or maybe he simply didn't expect it and was still wrapping his mind around this new guy, this kid, showing up and disturbing the flow. So several times I rephrased my question. You're saying this passage in Micah can be, like, uh, taken symbolically for what is going on today. I wish I could remember his answers, but what I can say is that for a short bit, he was simply not picking up what I was getting at. So I began to elaborate what I meant. I mean, this whole passage in Micah is about a time when war would end, and we won't need swords anymore. It's a hopeful picture of a future time. That's what the passage is about. So are you saying this verse is useful as an analogy for our modern times? No he replied. It seemed he finally knew what I was getting at. His reaction was not as I expected. His posture changed and his voice got louder. He clarified for me that his reading was correct 
it wasn't an analogy. <laughs> Note, he could have at least allowed for my point about the passage's original meaning, but he did not. He got defensive and made his point more directly, and he was not happy with me, for sure. It was all pretty surreal. I had a pleasant sense of calm about the whole thing. I wasn't trying to get a rise. I wasn't upset. Honestly, I felt that if I could be confused with his message, surely others could be too, and these were students of the Bible, I suspected, and if they read Micah like I had, and I was only 23 at the time, a mere youth, they could have noticed the same thing I did. Or maybe nobody else noticed this. Anyway, the teacher pushed back. The passage was about what he said it was about. So I went into clarifying questions mode. So you mean Micah wrote this passage to describe the fall from faith and the lack of appreciation for Scripture? That's what Micah meant this to be about? <laughs> Apparently, yes. And so I continued. So that's what he was thinking about when he wrote it. This approach didn't get very far. I'm honestly not sure he had ever processed any of these kinds of thoughts. He was not comfortable with this line of reasoning. So when Micah wrote it, I continued, the people who read it, the other Israelites, are you saying that's what they thought it was about? He became clearly agitated. He stood up and got even louder. And as we went back and forth, he moved closer and closer to me. This whole time, I was in a very peaceful state, relaxed. I was not fearful or troubled. Intrigued, yes, but calm. He began attacking my motives and my education. Man, I wish I could remember what he said, what I wouldn't give to have an audio recording of that whole event. He was not happy with me. Who was I to question him? Something must be wrong with me, naturally. Note that this entire time, not one murmur, not one word, or sound of either understanding or disapproval escaped from anyone else in this room. It was just me and the teacher. Well, that is until his tact shifted and he began to focus on me personally. That seems to have stirred something in one other person in the room. It was the hostess the one woman in the room. Maybe it was the natural instinct that arises when a guest in your house is being treated poorly. You know, hospitality and all. Or maybe she just felt for me, the young kid being treated rather aggressively. Or maybe she was genuinely interested in this discussion. And maybe she didn't know the rules. Since I saw no other women there, maybe women were regularly left out. Maybe she like me, was still new to this process and simply had no idea that asking questions of the teacher was very bad. Whatever it was, there was this sound that popped out of somewhere else in the room. I still remember where she was seated because the moment came as a surprise. I turned to my left and saw her sitting in her chair, slightly leaning forward, clearly following along. She said, I think he may have a point about Micah. I think I understand what he means. And she didn't get much more out than that. As if the room could get more chilled. Well, it did. The impression I got was that it was not appropriate for her to have spoken up. She must have sensed this too. And her input to the discussion ended as quickly as it had started. I kind of wonder if her husband gave her the look. The teacher never addressed her and turned back to me, steadily more aggressive in his approach. Now, still under a perhaps naive belief that I could explain myself and that clarity on the passage was important, a mental image popped into my head, and so I shared it. Uh, it seems to be making Micah harder to understand, I said. It's like you opened the Bible to Micah 4 and placed a pane of glass over the page. 
then your explanation is like painting a picture on the glass over the text. As you keep painting, it's harder and harder to see what was originally there. I'm pretty sure at that point that I may have physically moved my hands like I was holding a piece of glass over my Bible and then tilted my head like I was trying to see past something on the glass. <laughs> In hindsight, I'm sure that that extra theatrical effort made it worse. But you know me by now. And I'm rather multimedia, so physically illustrating while verbally explaining just came naturally. He came right up to me, his toes about to my toes. He was already rather tall, and I was in one of those soft couches, so I was already rather low. He spoke to me with strong, authoritative words, towering over me when he did it. He was trying to end the conversation by pressure. I didn't get the clue. I reiterated that I entirely agreed with his point about modern society and Christianity moving away from Scripture. It is very well depicted, figuratively, as swords being beat into pruning hooks. It's powerful imagery. It's just not the actual meaning of Micah 4. To clarify, I read the verse or two from Micah 4 leading up to the passage in question, but it never got anywhere. When I didn't respond to his final authoritative move right up against me, it probably wore him out. It's even possible that he might have started noticing that he was the one who appeared to have a problem, and he backed away. And I didn't continue. He never acknowledged any validity to what I was saying, and I'm sure he was in no way changing his mind. He seemed sure that this was what Micah 4.3 was all about. We ended the meeting and then had lunch together. The teacher didn't sit anywhere near me, so I never got to do a follow-up chat, an afterglow. The rest was just small talk. My original contact, the blind fellow, was polite and expressed that my questions were interesting, but not much more than that. I left after lunch, and that was the last I saw of them. The number of thoughts this experience gave me and continue to give me is remarkable. Let me just dump a few things here. Observation 1. Pressure. His reaction to me was to use manipulative pressure. He was not interested in truth. He wasn't. He was convinced he was right, but his view could not be argued. It was to simply be accepted as presented. He was probably well-versed at using this technique, the looming and towering over those who dared to question him. Think about it. He tried pressuring me, a stranger, a kid, in front of the entire room, and this didn't strike him as inappropriate. If he was willing to come at me, a guest, just imagine what it would be like for one of their own, someone in the group, to question him. Which brings me to observation two. External identity. I think I know why the room was silent. They all knew the procedure and they knew the price. The rules of belonging were deeply implanted and they followed them faithfully. There was a motivation that drove them, yes, but it wasn't seeking the truth. The motivation was to remain a part of this group, to belong to be in good standing. I mean, it was a special group, right? They were it, the final ones, walking the very, very narrow road, single file, to their assured reward. The group was an external identity. It did not originate from within. It was pressed upon them by words, attention, the affirming lift of being in agreement, it's kind of like mob mentality, surrendering your own conscience to the will of the throng. It feels empowering. It feels like you are now something special. It feels like all is right. But it feels that way because giving yourself into the group is a way to escape the internal sense of disquiet, of unease. At some level, you know all is not right. But the sweet, affirming, active belonging 
is just the rush you need to drive that unease away. And you feel alive. You are set free from the pain. Unfortunately, that pain you escaped was the truth. Identity in a group is a severely powerful influence. A positive affirmation is one thing. A recurring affirmation, which sustains you and gives you purpose and feels like love, that's a problem. The bolstering support of others convinces you that all is well. It's why you probably haven't seen a riot with one individual. One guy running down the street yelling, throwing rocks through business's window, climbing through the shattered glass, and then exiting with a television. One guy do that? No. Why? Because he's too exposed. Exposure, that is being clearly seen, is a form of truth. It's why we associate truth with light and lies with darkness. Luke 12, 2, nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. One doesn't riot alone because the discomfort of the exposure. Why is there discomfort? What's wrong with a good private riot? It's because you have no affirming support to quell the inner guilt and shame. You are wrong and you feel that truth because there isn't enough there to drown it out. So to effectively riot, you need a group. The group masks your individual wickedness. It feeds you with a steady flow of belonging, and that overrides the conscience. So my whole experience that day, the silent students, the authoritative teacher, and not asking questions, it points to a bit of irony. They say they are the true remnant, those who followed the truth and left behind the falsehoods. But how would they know? The teacher had stepped into the space between them and their creator, and they accepted this arrangement. Here's the irony. If they can't challenge, think, and push to really see what the scriptures say, if they are simply taking their leader's word for it, then they've placed their trust on him. Then, uh, their swords, have they not been beaten into plowshares? Looking back, I can understand why he was so agitated. Because I was not. He wanted an adversary worthy of his judgment. He needed me to be wrong so that he could feel right again. But I gave him nothing. I was representing truth to him. I had no fear, no anger, no resentment. I wasn't responding to his pressure. I was a reminder of what he was not. Naturally, pride reacts against that. So, they had an organization that sustained and fed his pride. But it's a house of cards. Pride precedes a fall. For that teacher, therefore, anything that reminds him that something is wrong will be seen as the enemy. It's threatening the organizational edifice. By not reacting to his towering pressure, I technically gave him what he needed, but not what he wanted. And I didn't have to be brilliant or clever or have degrees. I just needed to be honest and patient and uninterested in playing along with the exciting church family board game, Bend to My Will, for four or more players ages eight and up. You can do the same. You don't have to know the answers. Instead, just be willing to turn on the light. Be willing to patiently ask and to seek. By being patient with others and not pawns of their pressure games, you can be a source of truth, even if you haven't figured it all out yet. Of course, don't expect that others will necessarily appreciate it. I gladly welcome emails sent to podcast at unitarianchristianalliance.org. I love hearing your voice too, and so do others. There's a record link in the show notes 
but I'll take the audio clips any way that you can send them. The UCA has created a directory to help connect people. It can be lonely when you don't have people you can gather with, and this tool could be one way to help. Sign up for free at UnitarianChristianAlliance.org or do a small monthly or annual contribution if you like, but you don't have to. The way it works is that someone clicks on your profile and sends a message through the website. It comes to you as an email. If you reply to the email on your own, not through the UCA website, you've begun the communication and hopefully have a new friend. You'll communicate through your email. It is possible that you are getting emails from people and don't know it. Maybe you don't check that email much anymore. Maybe it's going into spam. If you want to test it, go to your account on UnitarianChristianAlliance.org and send yourself a message. Watch for the email. Or ask a friend to send you one. Or ask me. I'm always up for meeting new folks, so I'd be glad to say hello through the contact page and help you test that you are still up and running. We don't want seeking people to first be overjoyed to see folks near them, only to then be disappointed when they reach out and never hear back. One of my favorite parts of this podcast is that when we listen to other people's stories, we may discover that we kind of might live in a bubble. Some folks I've spoken with had never had a glimpse into high-control groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses, and Lorene's interview in the previous two episodes were eye-opening. Like, you may hear about that kind of control and think, nah, it can't be like that. That's an exaggeration. It can seem that way because it's incredible. It's so outside your world. But Lorene's description only touched upon some of the control. It can be extensive. If you've ever researched other groups, other cults, you likely discovered the darkness seems to have no limit. There are some very, very, evil things afoot in this world. We need to pray for people caught in those and be there for them if they get the courage to break the rules and reach out for help. I hope Lorene's conversation will help us be more compassionate and understanding. Like Dan DeFrang described in episode 37, being there to listen and to love is what many people need. Another event is now listed on the UCA upcoming events page. June now has three events listed, New York, Indiana, and Kentucky. September has an event in New York. Go to UnitarianChristianAlliance.org and click on Events to see the upcoming events listing. And more stuff is in the works. You may know someone who would appreciate this episode. Maybe they have had the joy of asking questions at the, apparently, wrong time. And maybe it would help them recognize when an external pressure is seeking to find its way in and in recognizing it, hopefully, prevent it. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well.